And um, I, I want to share something out of the word with you today that I think um, I've just been praying. I've been asking the Lord, God, give me something. Give me something that's going to encourage people. Give me something that that's really going to speak directly into some situations tonight. And that's my prayer. My prayer is that that's what this does. Amen. So we do me a favor and will you pray with me? It's been a long weekend. So pray with me. Pray for me. Pray for pray. We'll all pray. Will we all pray? Sound good? Hallelujah. Jesus, Lord, we thank you tonight, God, for your goodness, Lord, for the goodness of the Word of God, Lord, for that good seed, Lord, because when it finds its place into fallow ground in the heart, Lord, things change. Things change, Lord Jesus. Help us, God. We don't want to be entertained. We want to be transformed, Lord. We want to be not conformed to this world, to the pattern of this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word, God. It's through your word. Open our hearts, Lord Jesus. Open us right up now, God, just to hear what the Holy Spirit might be saying to us in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. Praise God. Okay, let's go. It's great to meet my brother Victor as well. Victor's here. I love Victor. Uh, one of the nicest guys I met him. But when I met him, I'm about five foot eight. That's in my wife's high heels. I'm about five foot eight. And Victor is, is you probably haven't been five foot eight for a while. <laughs> so I remember meeting this guy and just going, this is, this is literally a friendly giant. So I'm shouting this guy out. I love it. And Ben came in. Ben, ben was usually typically the tallest person in the room. And Ben came in and it was like, man. I'm like, Ben, this is my life, Ben. My wife is taller than me. <laughs> this doesn't stop, even when I go home. But anyway, anyway, it's a constant area where God has to work on my life, you know. Uh, uh, we have a um, garden, and the garden, uh, now Laura isn't here. I can talk about our garden. Our lawnmower doesn't work, and our garden, the grass is like here. So do you remember watching Jurassic Park? back in the 90s, early 90s, and, and you couldn't go in the long grass because there were raptors in the long grass. It's like that. There's raptors in the grass, Jimmy. Raptors, it was like, it's, it's that long now where, you know, Laura's like, can you just go to the shed and get something? I'm like, later, <laughs> you know? You know, you, kind of, you want to go in broad daylight, you know, that kind of thing. So our grass is overrun. And a part of our garden being overrun is that there's slugs, right? There's slugs. Everyone knows a slug? Slugs, yeah. Not right. And what happens is they actually manage to crawl in under our, our back door. And sometimes I walk into our back room and they're on our carpet. These slugs, it was gross. So uh, I, I'm talking about slugs because I want to talk about uh, the, the, the title of the message tonight is slug repellent. We've all heard of slug repellent. You throw the slug repellent and the slug is repelled. You've heard of that? Well, I hope you never have to. If you haven't heard of it, I hope you never have to buy slug repellent. But I want to talk about, as, and I hope it's going to make a level of sense here, but I want to read out of the scriptures out of Hebrews chapter 6. Um, the Hebrew writer is talking, actually the whole context of the verse, the Hebrew writer is actually talking, a lot of people would say about apostasy, talking about falling away and, and this idea of the land drinking up the rain, but not producing a harvest. I want to kind of skip that, although that is the context, and I want to talk from verse 9. So verse 9 says, this. I'm going to read it from the ESV, okay? Then I'm going to read it from the NLT. So the ESV is like the meat and potatoes, and the NLT is like the dessert, okay? So <laughs> if you don't know what I mean, check it out. This is the Hebrew writer now. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Hallelujah. Verse 10, for God is not unjust. Say not unjust not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the same, to have the full assurance of hope. There's some good words there. Try it. Say them with me. Full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish. Sluggish. See where I'm going with the slug thing, right? Dad pun, you get over 30 and you start, dad puns start to feel, do you know what I mean? You start to, this actually, maybe that's not so bad. Maybe I can say that in a message. Do you know, even everybody now is looking at me like deadpan. Everybody's like, <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> We're working through. So you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. 
Now I'm going to do it in NLT. Dear friends, even though we're talking this way, we don't really believe that it applies to you. We're confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. For God's not unjust. He will not forget how hard you've worked for him and how you've shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Interesting verse, isn't it? We show our love to God by loving that which he loves, other people, right? Our great desire is that you will keep on loving as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. So when the ESV says sluggish, the verse means, what it means is spiritually dull and indifferent. Okay, so you, may, so you wouldn't come under the spirit or this f- sense of indifference. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and their endurance. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about having hope when you're waiting on a promise from God, right? We all hear that, that, you know, we sing songs, we talk about waiting on God, right? Wait upon the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Those who wait. The first thing, if somebody tells me that I need to wait, the first thing I want to know is, well, for how long? Right? Because I need to know for how long. Okay? So if I'm waiting for the two o'clock bus, right, and my phone is on 20%, I'm going to need to charge that thing because I'm going to have to wait for the bus and ride the bus. And so the way that I wait depends a lot on how long I'm waiting for, right? Okay, so if you're going somewhere and you're waiting for five minutes, you're not, you don't need to worry about entertainment. You don't need to worry about keeping yourself busy, this, that, and the other. But the thing about waiting on God, right, as opposed to waiting on the 220 that leaves from the bottom of my estate, right, is that you don't know how long you'll be waiting for. It's true, isn't it? You get this promise, you get this word from God, you get this divine kind of experience, the Holy Spirit opens something up, speaks something into your spirit, and it's like, it's like you can reach out and you can touch it, and you can, you can apply it, and you can, it's, it's like that. And it's a funny thing, um, I don't climb a lot of mountains, I don't climb a lot of anything, I struggle to climb the stairs, I don't do a lot of climbing, but when you stand on top of a mountain, and you look down into a valley, you can see the other side of the valley, okay? But what you maybe don't see is the topography, the terrain, the ups, the downs, the ins, the nows, all that kind of stuff. When you look at a promise through time, God is saying, I'm going to do this. You see it, but you don't necessarily see the journey to it, right? That's kind of what I'm talking about now. So we understand the concept of waiting, but how do we wait? What does waiting look like? And how do we wait without losing hope? How do we wait without becoming discouraged and losing hope and losing, a, a losing and, and we, we go from earnestness, which the writer talks about, to being sluggish or fruitless or indifferent or spiritually dull. Have you ever been there? You're waiting for so long, you kind of lose your luster for the things God has set in front of you. You're waiting for so long, trusting, believing for so long. Your, your, your luster, your energy, your enthusiasm to just do the simple things God has put in front of you for today, it starts to dwindle. I'm putting my hand up. Even if I'm preaching to myself, preach on, Pat. That's true, that's me, that's me. Is that you? It's me. It's me. It's me. This is me. Do you know what I mean? It really is. So I want to look at this. I've got just a few just basic points, and then I want to look at an instance from Scripture. Okay, listen. Don't let waiting on a promise discourage you from uh, discourage you from your earnestness and push you towards being sluggish. Okay, don't don't let that happen. You ever find yourself thinking or saying, "What's the point? It's never going to happen." for me anyway. What's the point in trying? You ever go there in your heart? Maybe it's only for a second. Maybe you go there in your mind. But there's this sense like, what's the point? This is, this is out of reach. This is out of grasp. This isn't going to happen. And um, I have um, a wonderful wife. I love my wife. She is my best friend in all the world. She's excellent. She's in the back now just going, right? Just a little shout out to, uh, does everyone follow Mrs. Hinch on Instagram? Right, ladies, anyone follow Mrs. Hinch? 
my wife has discovered Mrs. Hinch. Mrs. Hinch basically is, is the cleaning guru of cleaning gurus. So Laura was like, oh, I'm just following Mrs. Hinch. I'm really into cleaning. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm like, she's like, yeah, I'm going to buy loads of stuff. I'm going to keep everything clean. I love clean things. I start by cleaning. And she's like, I'm going to keep everything clean. Everything's going to be clean. Everything's going to, and I'm going to be like, you should do that. Yeah, I support you. You know, you always support anything you want to do. You know? So she, so she's, she's epic. My wife is epic. Um, and for me, the past five years, have been magic. Best five years of my life. I don't mind saying that about my wife. Easy. You're going to have to indulge me. If you're sitting there just going, this guy, you're going to have to indulge me, right? But I'm going to tell you a story um, from before I met my wife, okay? And I'm just going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be honest. Um, I was in a relationship that's ended in a failed proposal, okay? It ended in a failed proposal. And I remember after that happened, my luster, because I'd believed in something for so long, for something for so long, my luster or my ability to see past this epic collapse in my life stopped me from investing myself into ministry for a long time. I found for a long time I wasn't able, I didn't, I didn't want to do it. Why should I, God? You didn't come through for me in this area. I just don't have any sense of I don't want to do this anymore. And I went there in my heart for a long time. And it's funny, it was only when I began to serve, God started to touch my life. I, only, I, I touch on that now because I want to give you an example from my own life before I get into what I think the scripture speaks about on this a little bit more. But don't be discouraged out of serving people. Don't let life discourage you out of service just because it hasn't happened yet. And listen, this might sound tough, but this is true. Don't dress up entitlement with half-heartedness. The things that God brings into our life, the blessings he brings in, the things that he drops from on high to us. James says, everything good comes from the Father of heavenly lights through whom there's no turning or variation due to change. Every good thing that comes down from heaven comes from God. But none of it is a, is, 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 is a wage for, for, for works rendered. God owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. Bible says in Romans 4 that Abraham received the promise because, not because of works, but because he believed in the one who what? Who, who, who justifies the ungodly. He believed in God, the one who calls the unrighteous righteous on account of the work of Jesus. And because he took God at his word on the basis of his character, Abraham received what he was promised. Okay? But Abraham knew that it wasn't something he was going to work for. It was something that God was going to give him according to grace. And sometimes that's a lesson we have to learn when we wait. That this has got to be God giving this up to me. And sometimes we can get half-hearted and we can feel half-hearted when we've got, we've got a, a city that's white in the world. Lives that can be touched and changed. And we, we, because things aren't falling into place, personally, we kind of fall back in ministry and in serving God. Bible says that we show what we should show earnestness when we wait, when we wait, when we in that place of trust. We should be earnest, we should be energetic, we should be fruitful while we wait, okay? It's going to make some more sense as we go on. But listen people, God will be faithful to you, to me. He's going to honor he'll uh, let, so let's honor him in our waiting. Listen, the seeds of tomorrow's promises are scattered and they're planted today. The seeds of tomorrow's promises they're scattered they're planted today. I've met a lot of people who who see the long term, I want to be this, I'm going to be this. God's spoken this into my heart, into my life. But they they're reticent in the short term to make decisions or choices because they don't understand how this step can ultimately end up in that place. Well, I feel God's called me to be a missionary. And right now I need a job, but the only thing opening up for me is in Starbucks. But I don't think I should take it because God's called me to be a missionary. Maybe you need money for now. And the missionary stuff, maybe, maybe someone's going to walk into Starbucks one day from a missions agency and see how faithful you are pouring coffees for people and say, you, you should be a missionary. You don't know. The fact of the matter is the discordant strands of your life, it's not for you to weave them into a tapestry. God does it. 
God will take the strands that don't, it, how is this going to, how is this going to happen, God? Think about Joseph in a prison cell, in a, in a prison cell. God spoke to him, spoke to him, showed all his brothers bowing down, worshiping him, worshiping him. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to, you're all, and Joseph in his youth, in his, in his immaturity comes to all his brothers and says, guess what, boys? You're all going to bow down to me. Isn't that awesome? And Reuben, uh, his oldest brother, kind of leans, actually, he was the gracious one because he didn't want to kill him, just sell him uh, into slavery, right? Uh, <laughs> yet, even in that, and you know what I find interesting about Joseph's story is that he had so many false starts, didn't he? He's sold into slavery, but he's bought by Potiphar. And now he's in Potiphar's house, and he's young, and he's dynamic, and he's rising through the ranks. And he's looking, he's thinking, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the manifestation. Maybe this is what God has shown me. This is my moment. This is my time. Why is she looking at me like that? <laughs> Why does she keep looking at me like that? And all of a sudden, Potiphar's wife is getting a little too cozy, okay? And he's like, this is my moment. And until one day, she makes her move. He stands in his virtue, in his righteousness, in his honesty, and she frames him, and he goes to jail. 17 years old. The vision, the promises of God, and now he's in a jail cell. The Bible says he's there for 11 years. Yeah, that's not a couple of lines on a page. That's 11 years of your life. 11 years. This false start in Potiphar's house. Think about the discouragement. Lord, I felt like I was on the incline to the top of the mountain, and boom, cliff edge, valley, and here I am. I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner. And then the cupbearer and the baker show up. And Joseph just extends to them graciousness. He's just gracious. He's just kind to them. But he says, just do me one thing. Remind, speak. When you get out of here, talk to Pharaoh. Tell him there's someone in here who can interpret dreams. Do me a solid. The Bible says they forgot about him. He was there for another two years. You think about this. 17 to 30. But in a moment, while Joseph is sitting in a prison cell, feeling like those dreams are out of reach, God is giving Pharaoh dreams in his bed. Think about this. While he's sitting in that prison cell, thinking, how am I ever going to get to this place, Lord? How is this ever going to be? How am I ever going to reach this, this pinnacle, this climax in my life? God is giving Pharaoh dreams. And God calls, and Joseph goes from the prison, right, to the penthouse in a day. In just a day, God takes him... now. Uh, you were a prisoner, now you're prime minister, right? That's what God can do. God can turn it all around like that. God can bring that moment and will bring that moment at the opportune time, at the perfect time. But we can't be discouraged even when there are false starts. Even when there are false starts. What is in your hand? Do you remember when God called Moses? So I'm going to send you back to get my people. Well, that's awesome, God. Where's the army? Well, I don't have an army, but I've got your 86-year-old brother and a stick and a one-line sermon. You're welcome. God, you're sending me back to the most powerful, militarily powerful country in the world, civilization right now, to people who wanted me dead, to the most powerful man in the world. And you've got a one-line sermon and a stick, the same stick I've used every day to herd, to herd what? What, did, what was he doing with that stick every day? What was he doing with that the same stick you used to herd sheep? And go back to Egypt and herd my sheep. Go back to Egypt. You can, if you can lead those sheep, then you can lead my sheep. I'm going to take that stick, that innocuous thing that you may not think is anything. And that's going to be through. That's the way. It's the relationship you don't think, think means anything. It's the individual in your life. It's the, it's the unimportant opportunity that doesn't seem like anything and yet it's through that that God is going to bring about every promise in your life that's but what happens if you say well God you know I can't be a deliverer until you know I need an army so what good is this stick you know and we kind of give God the terms the terms you know God 
you know, you want me to do this, or you want me to go here, and you want, you know, I know that this, this, but this is how I'm going to get there. You ever hear the story about the guy uh, on top of a roof? Uh, everything was drowned. If, you know, there was water rising around him. There was um, a flood, and and he's climbed up to the roof to escape the the torrents of water, right? And he's praying, saying, "God, will you will you save me? Will you deliver me?" And a guy on a boat cruises by and says, hey, you look like you're in trouble. Do you want to just jump in the boat? No, God is going to save me. And then next, a guy flies by in a helicopter with a rope ladder, swinging in the wind like that. Grab on. (laughs) Grab on. I'm going to say, grab. It's "It's okay. God is going to save me, right? Yeah? Can you guess where this is going to go? The waters rise, rise, he drowns. He gets up and he's in front of God and he's like, Lord, I had such a clear vision, such a clear promise you're going to save me. And the Lord was like, the boat, the rope, the rope ladder. You want me to peel the clouds back and scoop you up, pick it up? When we stop giving God the terms... And when we start, did you know, these are all things that we do. And it actually is, a, is it's, there, it's ways that we get to put down the, 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 the sticks while we wait instead of being fruitful. Okay. Uh, point number three, God sees the sacrifices you make as you serve him. This is, this is for me, right? Even if you put a mirror right here, this is for me. God sees the sacrifices you make as you serve him, even if others don't. He will be faithful to you. Let that give you hope, people. Let it give you hope, right? Let it give you confidence. Often the personal costs remain unseen to all but him, okay? We must not lose hope when others fail to see the whole picture. Keep pouring out the oil. Keep pouring out the oil. I want to turn as a passage of scripture here in 2 Kings verse 4, chapter 4, about a woman. She's a widow, uh, and uh, she meets the prophet Elisha. And what I find really cool about this is tradition would say that this widow, well, actually, no, let me read it, and then I'm going to get back to you. Elisha and the widow's oil, 2 Kings 4 verse 4, now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what should I do for you? Tell me, what have you in your house? And she said, your servant has nothing in, her, in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they began to bring the vessels to her. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and she told the man of God and said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your son can live on the rest. What's interesting about this is tradition teaches us that that woman was actually the wife of the prophet Obadiah. Okay, so Obadiah worked for King Ahab during the kind of career of Elijah. Okay, so do you remember when Elijah runs from uh, Jezebel and he says to God on Mount Horeb, they've killed all of the prophets. I'm the only one left. And God says, I've kept those 7,000 who've not bowed the knee to Baal. Okay, now we, what we understand about that story is that those prophets were hidden in caves. They were hidden in caves that were purchased by a one of the ministers of Ahab who was called Obadiah, the prophet Obadiah, who wrote the book of Obadiah. This was, what, this was his widow. How about that for some context? She comes to Elisha and she says, Elisha, my husband is dead. We're broke and the creditors are coming for the money we spent on the caves. Think about this. Think about this. The money we spent on those caves, now the creditors are here. They're at the door. They're knocking. We can't pay, and they want to take my sons as slaves. How about that for a situation? 
How about that for serving God faithfully and getting hit with calamity? This woman had sacrificed, given of herself, experienced personal loss, given everything to serve for the testimony of God. And now look at the calamity. Look at what's come to a door. Calamity strikes. People, listen to me. Just because you're serving God, just because you're faithful in the house doesn't mean that things won't happen. You're not life proof. You're eternity proof, right? You're not life. We're not life proof. We're not suffering proof. We're eternity proof. Calamity strikes because it strikes. Bible says in Romans 8, all things, right? All things. In all things, God is at work for the good and the lives of those who he loves, who are called according to his purposes. So that, that's not so much the good and the bad as all things coming and God being good in all things. And so here this thing happens. And the prophet comes to her, Elisha comes to her, and she's saying, we've got nothing. This is struck, we've got nothing. I'm, I'm faced with a problem and I don't see a resource. And then here's that echo, that idea of what's in your hand. What is in your home? And she says, all we've got is the oil. We've just got a little bit of oil. That's all we have. Everything else is gone. They're coming for my sons. And all I have in the house is a little bit of oil. And it's so funny. When we're serving, when we're waiting, when we're trusting, and God is coming and the need is there and the problem is there, and we keep coming back to God going, God, I've got nothing. I've got nothing. I've got nothing except the spirit you've put in me. I've got nothing except the love that you've shed abroad in my life that I can now give to other people. I've got nothing except the spirit you've put in me. God, I've got nothing but for the fact that you're living in me. Can we just hit pause for a second here? Can we just hit pause? The third member of the Trinity, God Almighty, has taken up residence in you and me. If you're born again, if you profess Jesus as Lord, then the Holy Spirit, God, is living in you. All things, Peter says, pertaining to life and godliness. Everything in you. Jesus said, I'll not leave you as orphans, but I'll send one. The word is parakletos, paraclete, as in one who comes alongside and picks up. God in you. God in you. The hope of glory. That's what the word says. It's the mystery hidden for the ages, but now made apparent in the last times. Things that angels long to look into. The things that the Bible says that the prophets, foreseeing the grace that would come to us, prophesied of what was to come. The prophets looked forward to a day where God would make his abode in people. And then the problem comes and calamity strikes and the promise seems out of reach and, 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 and the need is still there and we're saying all we've got, all we've got is the oil, Right? But then the prophet says this, right? Pour it then. Pour it out then. In the midst of frustration, calamity, fear, loss, pour, don't pout. Pour, don't pout. When it all hits, when it's all falling to pieces, when everything, when nothing is falling into place, pour, pour it out. You've got something. You've got something. What does he say? Go to your neighbors. Go to your friends. Go to the people around you. Go to the people in your neighborhood, in your vicinity. See where you're planted? There. Find your vessels there. I'm not telling you to go a thousand miles to find a vessel. Go next door. Go to your friends. Go to the people in your life. And when you get there, pour it out. Pour out the oil. Pour out the love. Pour out the new wine of the gospel. Pour it. Pour it. Pour it. Don't stop pouring it. The more you pour it, the more oil you will find. The provision comes when we pour. We don't earn it, but when we pour it, there seems to be enough left over for us. It says, seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. When you pour it, it just seems to be there. You pour, you look around you, and there's enough left for you and your family. You pour it, you pour it, you pour it. Pour it. Don't, don't pout. Don't sit on the love of God instead of sharing it. All vessels needing to be filled. When we sit on the love of God instead of sharing it, when we wait for a promise or a provision, we tend to run ground in a dry place. 
when they stopped pouring the white, the oil stopped. The oil ran out. When we stopped pouring uh, as went in that place of waiting, that's the sluggishness. That's the indifference. That's the dullness that sets in. That's the dry place we find ourselves in when we stop pouring and start pouting. We find ourselves in a place that's dry. That's what happens, but it's not the will of God for us. It's not. It's not. Be encouraged to keep pouring. There's people all around us. And what I love, I'll end with this idea. Joseph is in a prison cell for 11 years, and the cupbearer and the baker come in. And what does he say? What does he say? How are you? How are you? How are you doing? How are you? They don't ask him how he is. How are you? How's it going? Tell me about you. Oh, my life? We won't go there. How about you? How about you? When I started to serve again, and I remember having moments going, I'm never, I'm 28. Who's going to marry me? Unless I was a lot thinner back then too, right? Who's going to marry How am I going to fight? I'm just, I'm just going to resign myself. I'm going to put my life down. And I'm going to start to meet the need. The first thing up for me was a concert. And it was a rapper called Esso. And I didn't want to do it. I had no interest in doing it. But he kept emailing me. <laughs> and if he watches this, you did. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'll do it. And I did it. And then there was... There happened to be a, 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 a opening actually in our youth ministry. And it was more a need rather than me being some big youth guy. There was a need. So I stepped into it and I started to pour and pour and God healed my life. He healed my life. And then one day I had to sit down and talk to a youth leader. I had a disagreement with her. And when I finished talking to her, I realized actually she's, she's not bad. Do you know? And then she started to send me roses and flowers and pursue me. <laughs> And out of the service, out of the working, the serving, the, 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 the just putting down my life, God gave me more than I ever could have worked to earn from him. Let's pour it out, people. Let's pour it out. Let's do it. Let's just do it. What is it? What's the need? Let's just do it. Do you, you don't have the money? Okay, neither do I. Let's, what's the need? Let's just do it. Let's just be it. Let's just be it. As long as there are vessels, let's be about pouring and we will, I'm telling you, and you can quote me, right? Your life will be full. There will be enough for you to live on. There will be a provision. Amen? Can we just pray together? Let's pray together. And I hope that that encourages you at least on some level. Jesus God, I just pray, Lord, tonight that for anybody here who, Lord, may be in that place of waiting, they might be waiting for something, God, but that it's just not happening and there's a frustration and a dryness coming in, and there's just a sense, Lord, that God, how, I don't have the, 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 there's no even incentive to keep going, God. I pray that you would just come again. Come again to us, Lord. Show us what you have given us, even in that place of waiting or even of loss. Show us what you have given us, and help us to pour it out anyway. Help us to pour it out anyway, Jesus. Anyway, despite what's going on, help us to pour it out. Despite how we're feeling, help us to pour it out. Despite the unanswered questions, the question marks, the things that we can't reconcile on our own, the things that keep us up at, at night, God. I pray that when we sit down and we look and, uh, and we get into places where there's need, we rise to it, Lord. And we turn around and we say, how are you? What can I do for you? How can I pour into your life? How can I encourage you? Jesus, help us to be encouragers. Because that's the greatest encouragement. The greatest encouragement is to encourage others. Help us, God, to be encouragers. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Listen, guys, I just want to, you know, uh, I just, I just <laughs> I, there's one, there's, can, I, can I just plug something as well before we, we go and have tea and coffee and all that? Can we just encourage people more, right? Now, um, if, if some of us are married here, some of us are getting married, and, you know, 
and uh, all the guys who've had to buy an engagement ring in the house, wave at me if you had to be, uh, you know what I'm saying, right? So what they say about engagement rings is that you've got to work for three months. It's three months wages. I I'm, I'm a pastor, man, so listen, I just reached my pocket and found one. <laughs> Three months of wages ain't no thing. It's supposed, yeah, supposed to be three months, right? And I remember going into a jeweler's and looking with my budget, my paltry budget, at rings. And three months wages didn't buy me much at all. They had to, uh, they had to get out, you know, the, the, the magnifying glass. And it looked like the Hubble, like, kind of, I was like that, looking at the ring, you know, that kind of thing. Let's not, too often encouragement can be like that. You gotta work three months to get it, and when you get it, it's tiny. See what I'm saying? You gotta work real hard for real long to get just a little bit of encouragement. We just don't give it. Not like we should. Not like we should. Encouragement shouldn't be like an engagement ring. It shouldn't be working three months to get something that's so small you need a telescope to see it. Amen? Sound good? All right. I think the kettle is still on.